Hi again. In this series of programs, we're going to take a look at transmission, transition metals. In the first program, we'll look at their general properties. In the second one, we'll focus on complex ions that they form. And in the third and final program, the colors that these solutions uh, have. So let's begin with the definition. IUPAC defines a transition metal as an atom or cation that has a partially filled d orbital. Let's look at a classic member of that family. I'll begin by taking a look at iron. Iron with its 26 electrons. First two we place here, one here, one here, and the 2s, and we'll fill up the 2p orbital. Moving then up to the 3s orbital, the 3p orbital. And the next orbital you might recall isn't the 3d, but the 4s. We put two electrons in here because it's on average a slightly lower energy level. And with six electrons remaining, we'll put one in each of the orbitals, the 3d orbitals, and then number 26. So this is the 3d. So iron fits this very well. It's an atom with a partially filled d orbital. Let's take a look at another element. Let's take a look now at the element copper. Now, copper, you might recall, with 29 electrons, one might think that all we have to do is add three more electrons here, but you might recall that copper is one of the rule breakers and it actually promotes an electron from here. So we're going to take that one away for copper and we'll promote it so it now fills this. So the copper atom itself wouldn't fit this definition. However, copper does tend to form an ion with a 2 plus charge. And if we remove um, the highest energy level, so we'll remove that one and then that one, now we would see copper with a plus 2 charge does have um, a partially filled d orbital. So hence we say it's an atom or a cation with a partially filled d orbit. Let's finish off by taking a look at the element uh, zinc for a moment. Now if we go back to zinc's configuration, it would look like this, and it would be 3d10, completely filled. And when zinc forms an, an ion, it tends to lose these two from the 4s. And as a result, both the atom and the ion don't fulfill this requirement. So as a result, zinc is not considered to be a transition element. So if we take a look at the, the periodic table, our transition metals are in this region here. Pretty much the D block with the exception of the last column. Now let's take a look at the properties that these transition metals have. Let's take a look at the uh, first concept. They're what they considered paramagnetic. For that, I want to return to the highest energy level of our example iron from before. So from before, in the 4s orbital, iron had one here, and then it proceeded to put the remaining six electrons here and here in the 3d. For a substance to demonstrate what we call paramagnetism, it must have unpaired electrons. The greater the number of unpaired electrons, the greater the paramagnetic properties of the substance. So we can see iron here with four unpaired electrons would be considered to be quite uh, paramagnetic. If we considered the element copper for a moment, we can recall copper does this and we would now have an unpaired electron here. Copper is notoriously unparamagnetic with completely paired electrons now in this region here. Mind you, it does have one unpaired electron down here, but it wouldn't be as paramagnetic. And the element zinc, of course, with this configuration, would com be completely uh, non-paramagnetic, and in fact what we call diamagnetic. Anyway, the greater the number of unpaired electrons, the more paramagnetic, and most transition metals show varying degrees of paramagnetism. They also have what we call multiple oxidation states. 
let's take a look for at something uh, below here. I've got the element uh, calcium shown here. You might recall that to ionize calcium, we tend to remove electrons from the highest energy level. So calcium's configuration would look at the highest energy level. It would have two electrons in the 4s. And when it forms the calcium plus two ion, it would tend to lose those two. So I'm going to mark that ion right here. That would be calcium with a two plus charge. To form calcium with a three plus charge, we would have to reach down into an energy level that would be down here, which would be the 3p energy level. It's a whole energy level closer to the atom, and as a result, or to the nucleus. As a result, to remove this electron, there's that huge jump in ionization energy. So as a result, calcium only tends to have or exhibit one charge, two plus. Vanadium, in its configuration I'll show here, so vanadium has two electrons there and then three electrons here. When vanadium forms an ion, the first electrons that are removed aren't from the 3D, but from the 4S. So we tend to remove those two electrons. And that leads to the formation of this ion right here, which would be vanadium with a 2 plus charge. To remove subsequent electrons, we're just going to the 3D energy level. That's not a whole energy level closer. In fact, the distance between the 4S and the 3D from the nucleus is approximately the same. So these are about the same energy level. As a result, we only have slight increases in the energy associated with moving electrons. So we can essentially remove the next three, moving up to vanadium with a 5 plus charge. So as a result, vanadium is capable of exhibiting a wide range of um, possible oxidation states or charges because their ionization energies aren't much, uh, there isn't a big jump or a significant increase the way there is with calcium between the fourth and the third energy level. Here's a cable that's in your IB data booklet that shows the most common states that substances tend to have. So you can see in here our vanadium tends to have between two and five electrons removed. These are the most common states. There's a few patterns I'd like you to notice here in this table. Um, first of all, the, the group up to chromium, that tends to be the most stable isotopes, or most stable, I should say, ions formed by these species. Whereas for this group, plus two tends to be the most common oxidation state. Again, plus two comes because all of these species will tend to lose electrons from their 4s. The other pattern that you should notice in this table is as we move across from the element scandium across to chromium, you can see there's an increase in the number of oxidation states, and they tend to go up by one. So we get this pattern all the way across to manganese, where our, our oxidation states increase by one more option as we move further down. Now, these ones aren't shown, but they do exist. They're just not as common uh, on oxidation states. Once we move from iron over to zinc, what we tend to find is the oxidation states that are available tend to drop down by one. So I'm writing in here the other oxidation states that are less common um, in these species. So as we move from iron down, we get the general trend of sort of losing one possible oxidation state. And all of these do exist, but again I've highlighted here the most common ones uh, here in these red blocks. So that explains the concept of multiple oxidation states. Many of our transition metals act as catalysts. Uh, you might recall that in the Haber process, uh, iron oxide is often used in the Haber process in the production of ammonia Catalytic converters in cars tend to use vanadium oxide um, to help burn unused hydrocarbons and help convert uh, nitrogen oxides to nitrogen and oxygen. So these are examples of catalysts, and I say most catalysts contain complexes or ions uh, from this region. We also tend to form what are called complex ions. Let's take a look at what, what those look like.
Here's an example of a, a complex ion. We have a copper ion in the center surrounded by, in this case, a group of water molecules. And these lone pairs of electrons are shared essentially with that copper with a positive charge. The electrostatic attraction that exists between these negatively charged pairs and the positive copper ion creates what we call, and we've seen this before, what's called a coordinate bond, where one atom is doing all of the donating. So we have a This structure is called a complex ion. We would represent it this way with a square bracket. The copper is bonded to water molecules, in this case, six of them. And the overall charge on this species is two plus. So this is an example of a complex ion. Many of these complex ions exhibit colors uh, when in solution. Now we'll find out a little bit more about the nature of these complex ions in further programs. Anyway, thanks for watching and stay tuned for our next program on complex ions.